Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Glad to have you here. My name is John Marshall. I serve as president here at Colorado Mesa University, and we are absolutely thrilled to be able to host you all and to host this important conversation. Um, it's my pleasure to get to kick this thing off by introducing Jennifer Schubert Aiken. Jennifer is a friend and uh, serves as chairman and CEO of the Steamboat Institute, an organization that she founded in 2008. Steamboat Institute promotes America's first principles and encourages civilized discourse by hosting debates on college campuses all across America. Jennifer is a member of the advisory boards for the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado at Boulder and serves on the Ed Snyder Center for Enterprise and Markets at the University of Maryland. She also serves on the board of directors of Rebecca's Angels, a nonprofit organization helping children with post-traumatic stress disorder started by uh, Boston Marathon bombing survivor, Rebecca Gregory. Please help me welcome to the stage, Jennifer Schubert Aiken. Well, thank you, President Marshall, for that warm welcome, um, and to Derek Wagner that we've we've worked with many times. In uh, whoops, I'm dropping things all over the place. Okay, Ho hopefully that did not do any damage to any any technology. Um, so it's always great to be back in Grand Junction. Uh, those of us who live in the mountains, I'm from Steamboat Springs, love coming to Grand Junction in April. I bet half of Steamboat Springs is down here this week with their mountain bikes. So I'm surprised I haven't, haven't uh, run into any of my Steamboat friends yet. Uh, I know that the community of Grand Junction is very proud of CMU uh, and the CMU Civic Forum. I know you've had uh, some great speakers come through here. I know you just had Brett Stevens the other night, which I think is great. And we've had some great events partnering with the CMU Civic Forum and the Energy and Land Management Program. So I'd like to say hello to the students from the Energy and Land Management Program. We're, we're very happy you're here tonight with us. Steve Soychak, who runs that program. It's a great program, uh, nationally recognized, and we're just, we're proud to partner with you and have you here. Um, in addition to all of you here with us in Grand Junction tonight at CMU, we have several more people watching online. So we welcome our online audience as well. I know we have people signed up from literally uh, coast to coast, so we're happy to have those folks with us. Just to give you a brief background on the Steamboat Institute, since many of you probably are unfamiliar with our organization, we founded the Steamboat Institute in 2008 for the purpose of promoting America's founding principle, educating people about constitutional principles, and fostering an appreciation of the freedom we enjoy as Americans. We have hosted dozens of debates on college campuses all across the country over the past six years. And you might say, why debates? Well, because we can't maintain our democratic republic without citizens and leaders who are capable of civilized debate and discourse and being able to talk to each other and solve problems. For proof, just look at Congress, right? Um, tonight's debate is the fourth of five debates that we are hosting on campuses this semester, this spring semester, with a unique debate topic at each location. On March 6th, we were at the University of South Florida in Tampa with a debate on whether public funds should be used for DEI programs in higher ed. That was a, a great one. On March 21st, we visited the University of Tennessee in Knoxville with a debate on whether the American dream is dying. And last night, we were at the University of Colorado in Boulder with a debate on whether artificial intelligence poses a threat to our democracy. So if, if any of those pique your interest, you can find those on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. The videos are posted in their entirety. We um, encourage you to watch and share those. And then after tonight, we have one more on April 23rd. We will be at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York with a debate on are universities failing to provide a culture of free speech and open inquiry? So that, that should be very interesting. You can view the full debate schedule, um, all of the topics and speakers at steamboatinstitute.org. Uh, be sure to follow us on social media, of course, and, and sign up and, and get um, our email alerts. We uh, will have a full fall debate schedule that we'll be announcing um, in the coming months. With all of these debates also, you can watch live from anywhere. We do have student groups on some campuses who like to organize watch parties. So if they see a debate coming up that's of interest, but it's halfway across the country, you can still watch live. And 
if you're in our live, uh, our, our live stream audience, you can also participate by submitting questions to the speakers because we do everything virtually. So you can have a, a full experience even if you can't be here with us in person. For students uh, and young professionals, ages 20 to 29, we have a great opportunity coming up. Um, we have an opportunity for scholarships for our 16th annual Freedom Conference, a big event we do in, at the Beaver Creek Resort near Vail every year. So August 23rd and 24th, uh, 16th annual Freedom Conference, for 20 to 29 year olds, if you would be interested in attending this, we have scholarships. Go to steamboatinstitute.org, fill out the scholarship application. They're due June 14th. It's becoming very competitive, so uh, I hope you will consider that. It is a tremendous opportunity to meet with our nation's leaders in uh, media, education, government, uh, public policy, journalism, you name it. We've probably got someone uh, in one of those fields that, that you will recognize. So it's a great opportunity. Um, also general registration for the Freedom Conference, of course, for anyone is also open now. We will be um, announcing, spe announcing speakers in the next couple of weeks. Uh, some of our past speakers, if you've not attended a Freedom Conference, to give you an idea of the quality of the program. We've had former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Colorado Governor Jared Polis, um, Dana Perino, even country music superstar John Rich. So we, we try to have something for everyone and it's, it's always a great lineup and a lot of fun. As a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute relies on the support of many generous individuals and foundations to bring programs such as tonight's debate uh, to audiences across the country. I would like to say a very special thank you to the Adolf Coors Foundation for their very generous support, which has allowed us to expand the Campus Liberty Tour from just a few debates per year to 12 debates per year. I would also like to thank the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation, the Jack Roth Charitable Foundation, the Anschutz Foundation, the Tina Snyder Foundation, and the Considine Family Foundation for their support. All right, one of the hottest topics of the past several years involves our uses of different forms of energy and the impacts on the Earth's climate. Top climate scientists, engineers, and policy wonks have produced massive volumes of research and books on these issues, which seem to only lead to more debate and discussion and seems rarely a consensus on anything. Tonight's program will examine a particular area of the energy climate conundrum with a fair and balanced debate on the following resolution. Be it resolved, the US needs more nuclear energy. We invite all of our audience members, both those of you here in person and those watching the live stream, to uh, give us your, respond to the survey, at giving us your view on this resolution. Do you agree? disagree or are you undecided? So this is one time, it's not rude to take out your phone and uh, use your phone to vote in the poll. Um, as you will see, we're, we're, we're getting a, a few votes here. I'm guessing since we don't have anyone disagreeing, I bet we don't have everyone voting yet. So please vote, uh, whether you're watching the live stream or here in person, um, the QR code is up in the corner if you need to scan it, but it, it, is a lot more meaningful if everyone participates. Then when the debate is over, we are going to ask for your opinions again to see if opinions have shifted. So keep in mind, this is, it's, this is not about winners and losers, but it's more about gauging what you learned and if your opinion shifted. All right, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers and moderator for this evening. So I would like to ask all three of you to just please come up on stage and take your seats. I'm going to introduce them, and then after I introduce all three of them, we will ask the, uh, each speaker to make um, their opening statements. All right, arguing the affirmative on tonight's resolution is Jessica Lovering. Jessica is the co-founder and executive director of Good Energy Collective, a new organization building the progressive case for nuclear energy as an essential part of the broader climate change agenda. She is a fellow with the Energy for Growth Hub, looking at how advanced nuclear can be deployed in sub-Saharan Africa, and is also a senior visiting fellow with the Fastest Path to Zero initiative at the University of Michigan. Jessica earned her bachelor's degree in astrophysics from UC Berkeley, two master's degrees from CU Boulder in environmental studies, 
and Astrophysics and Planetary Sciences, and a PhD in Engineering and Public Policy from Carnegie Mellon University. Let's give a warm CMU welcome to Jessica Lovering. Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution is Mark Jacobson, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford University, Director of Stanford's Atmosphere and Energy Program, and Senior Fellow with both the Woods Institute for the Environment and the Precourt Institute for Energy. Professor Jacobson's career has focused on better understanding of severe atmospheric problems, such as air pollution and global warming, and developing large-scale, clean, renewable energy solutions to solve those problems. He has published dozens of peer-reviewed journal articles and several books, including his most recent, No Miracles Needed, How Today's Technology Can Save Our Climate and Clean Our Air. Professor Jacobson earned his bachelor's degrees in both civil engineering and economics, and a master's in environmental engineering from Stanford, and later earned his master's and PhD in atmospheric science from UCLA. Let's give a warm welcome to Professor Mark Jacobson. Our moderator for this evening's debate is Carrie Sheffield. Carrie is a columnist and broadcaster in Washington, DC, uh, she's also a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum. Carrie earned a master's in public policy from Harvard University, concentrating in business policy. She earned a BA with honors in communications at Brigham Young University and completed a Fulbright Fellowship in Berlin. Carrie has been published in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, CNN Opinion, the New York Times, Washington Post, and many others. And she's a frequent guest. You, you may have very well seen her recently on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, Newsmax, or uh, any of several outlets. So let's give a warm welcome to Carrie and our speakers. And now I'm going to let Carrie take over. Great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and thank you all, uh, we're excited to have you. Um, and so just in terms of format, we're gonna spend a little less than half an hour hearing directly from the speakers. They're gonna give opening statements. I'm gonna ask them some questions. And then this is where you get involved, uh, where you get to be part of, part of the questions. Uh, and so I hope that you can start formulating, uh, even just while you're you know, listening, because uh, I want this to be as active as possible. I want you to, to, bring, to bring your hardest questions possible, uh, but respectful. Uh, and just to get a quick sense, I, I love to know who's in the room. How many, you know, how many engineering or physics or kind of math students we have here? Okay, great. <laughs> uh, other disciplines? Shout out. I mean, if you want to shout it out, what are you guys studying? Perfect. Perfect. Great. Oh, that's good. I just like to know who's in the room. So. Um, excellent. Well, we're going to get started with the opening statement, so let's go ahead. And uh, Jessica? Great. Can you hear me? That sound, I sound very loud. Okay. Well, thank you to Steamboat Institute for having me. I'm very excited for this conversation. Uh, I'm just going to jump right in uh, in making the affirmative case. I think the main reason that we need more nuclear energy in the U.S. and globally is climate change. Uh, nuclear is the largest source of carbon-free power in the U.S., and that also has important benefits for public health and the environment more broadly. Of course, nuclear is not the only way to produce carbon-free electricity, so the real question I'm going to look at today uh, is why do we need nuclear at all when we have increasingly cheap and scalable alternatives like wind and solar? Now, there are plenty of nuclear advocates that you could have invited here tonight, um, that would trash renewables and say, we shouldn't build any wind or solar for lots of different reasons. Now, that's not me. Um, I think renewable energy is critical to deep decarbonization and we need a lot more of it. It might even be the majority of our electricity generation in the future. Mark has done some great modeling of 100% renewable systems. And while I agree that it's theoretically possible to do, uh, there are several real world constraints on such a system. And we see from a lot of other modeling at the national level that including some amount of nuclear um, just as an option actually makes it cheaper, faster, and easier to fully decarbonize the economy. Why is that? So, well, to keep the lights on and the factories humming, the power grid has to maintain this minute to minute balance between supply and demand. So when you have power generation from a variable or intermittent source like wind or solar, 
when generation drops, you know, at night or when it's not so windy, you need to ramp something else up to balance the load. Right now, cheap natural gas is making that very easy to do, but as we move towards a system with a lot more renewables on the grid and a lot less fossil fuels, those challenges get a lot harder. Uh, there's storage solutions like grid scale batteries. Those can help, definitely, but only for hours, not for days or weeks or even seasonal variations. Having more transmission lines, a kind of expanded transmission grid will also help, but there's two big challenges with that. One, wind power and even solar power are very temporally correlated. So when it's windy in the West Coast, it's also windy in the Midwest, and that's uh, you can't balance as well as you might think. The other one is that it's getting harder and harder to site new power lines, and we're actually not deploying new transmission at the scale and the speed that we need to um, to meet the uh, increased deployment of renewables. So I'm going to give you um, a great case study from my home state, California, um, to understand sort of how we're thinking about this. So three teams of energy modelers from Princeton, a consulting firm called E3, and Stanford actually, um, were commissioned to explore pathways to meet our state's mandate of 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. And what they found is that a 100% renewable system, renewables and storage, um, is definitely possible, but it's very challenging because you have to overbuild the system so much. So if peak demand in the summer in California is about 50 gigawatts, you need to have 500 gigawatts of renewables capacity on the grid to be able to meet that demand reliably. Uh, and they found that that would increase electricity rates by 65%. But if you include some clean firm power, uh, like nuclear, rates actually went down compared to the status quo. At the national level, we see the same thing, lots of models looking at different pathways. And if you include technologies like nuclear, it reduces the time and cost involved in the energy transition by as much as 60 to 100%. Now, even if we could accommodate high penetrations of renewables on the grid, they are not being deployed fast enough. And that is due to social and political constraints, not necessarily physical limits. So renewable energy takes up a lot of land, uh, especially compared to nuclear, which is very energy dense. And you may think, OK, we have a lot of land in the US. Is that really an issue? Um, but more land means more communities are impacted by these projects. And that opens up more room for opposition, um, for leg uh, legal battles against new projects. And what we're seeing is that it's getting harder and harder to site renewables projects. A recent survey of wind and solar developers uh, found that one third of projects that applied for permits in the last couple years were canceled. And community opposition was one of the top reasons for those cancellations. Beyond this sort of grassroots community opposition, 15% of counties across the US have some form of prohibition on new utility scale solar or wind. And about half of those bans were enacted in 2023. So opposition is growing. Uh, but I wanted to end on some positive notes. So I'm gonna highlight quickly some of the unique benefits of nuclear energy uh, beyond just climate change and emissions. So the first one is that it's affordable. And I know you're probably thinking, no, it's not. Nuclear is really expensive. And it is a lot of money up front for the construction. But once the plant's built, it provides cheap, reliable power for 60, 80, maybe even 100 years. And at the local level, Nuclear power plants provide a lot of jobs, more than any other type of power plant. And these jobs have higher salaries than the power sector average. They're also highly unionized. The plants are also huge sources of local tax revenue. And it's probably because of that that, OK, we interrupt. Yeah. Um, operating nuclear power plants have some of the strongest support um, from their local communities. And lastly, just one point to touch on uh, that's really rare these days is nuclear has really strong bipartisan support in Congress. Um, it's one of the only things that you can get votes on uh, with like in the Senate a 90 to 5 margin. Um, so in conclusion, I agree the US needs more nuclear energy primarily to help accelerate the transition to 100% clean power. We're just not deploying renewables fast enough and at the speed needed. And expanding nuclear will help and also provide a lot of local economic benefits. Thank you, Jessica. Mark? Well, thank you. Um, so, well, I'm gonna argue, first of all, that even if we want nuclear, new nuclear power plants, they're never gonna happen, especially in the time that we need them. I mean, 
in terms of climate problems, we need to solve 80% of the climate problem within the next six years by 2030, and 100% ideally by 2035, no later than 2050. But in terms of air pollution worldwide, there's over 7 million people die from air pollution each year, uh, due to from mostly from energy sources. And so that's an even more urgent problem to solve right away. And energy security is a third problem we're trying to solve. New nuclear power plants, that, well, the only new reactors built in the United States in the last 30 years, since 1993, aside from one that was started 40 years ago, was the Vogel reactors in Georgia. And they took 18 years from planning to operation. That's not just the construction time, that's the planning time, permitting time, and the construction time. 18 years. And that's not the only one. In, in Finland, a plant was opened. It took 22 years. Flamanville, France, it's taken 20 years. Hinkley plant is estimated it'll take 20 years. There, it's in North America and Europe. There are no reactors that are going to take less than 17 to 22 years from planning to operation. In the rest of the world, it's 12 to 22 years. In China, it's, it's also 12 to 14 years. To, well, to 16, 12 to 16 years. Even in the UAE, they just produced four reactors, but each of them took 12, 13, 14, 15 years from planning to operation. So in the US, if you're talking about the US, that'll put us in the 2040s. Even if you wanted to spend money on a nuclear reactor today or plan it today, it won't be ready till the 2040s, way too late to help us solve any problem. So why would we put that money in? Then look at how much money it costs. The Vogel plants in Georgia, $35 billion for 2.23 gigawatts. That's $15.6 dollars a watt. New solar is down to 0 0.7 dollars a watt, maybe rounded up to one. New wind and solar about one dollar a watt. So new nuclear in terms of capital cost is almost 16 times the capital cost of new wind or solar. Considering the higher capacity factor or you can run the nuclear plant more frequently, it's still about seven to eight times the levelized cost of energy of new nuclear versus new wind. So new wind and solar, despite opposition, most new wind and solar can go in within one to three years, maybe four years at, low, at the latest. Rooftop solar, half a year. So you're waiting around another 14 to 17 years for something that costs eight, seven to eight times more. Why would we do that? Why would we spend money on something that's not gonna help us one bit in solving the climate problems? That's only the start. What about energy security issues? There, there are five major energy security issues associated with nu new nuclear. Weapons proliferation risk. Five countries of the world have developed weapons secretly under the guise of civilian nuclear energy programs or test reactors. The meltdown risk. One and a half percent of all new nuclear reactors, all reactors ever built, have melted down to some degree. Waste issues. You have to store radioactive waste for 200,000 years. And that right now, all the waste is being piled up on the nuclear reactor sites. Then there's underground uranium mining risk. 10% of all underground uranium mining miners have died of lung cancer from radon progeny uh, like polonium that get into their bodies. And then nuclear is not carbon free, even though it's low, lower than natural gas. Sure, it's not as low as wind or solar. It's fact, it's nine to 37 times half of that times the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions of new wind, for example. Half of that's due to the fact that it takes so long between planning and operation of a plant. While you're waiting around, you have emissions from the background grid going up. Then you have emissions associated with building the plant, then also mining and refining uranium. Uranium has to be mined. It's a very energy intensive process. And so that's not, uh, those are significant issues. And then I wanna just mention something about grid stability. Today, California is 100% renewables on the grid uh, for at least four hours. And for the fact, for the 27 out of the last 33 days, California has been 100% renewables for a portion of the day. There are, there are now 12 states that in the annual average, including Colorado, well, Colorado's at 40% renewables in the annual average, but there are 12 states between 53% and 96% renewable, clean renewable energy in the annual average. You wouldn't guess which one's the top, South Dakota off wind. And that's also one of the cheapest source, states with the cheapest electricity. And so, in fact, there are seven countries of the world that are 100% renewable uh, in the annual average. So renewables are here, and they're here to stay, and they can solve the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to ask some questions. And, and I think 
you know, when I ask each question, feel free for the other person to respond because I'd, I'd love for you guys to interact with each other too because I saw you shaking your head against something he was saying. Um, and I think one of the things you were, you seemed to be disagreeing with was uh, the argument about cost. Um, so address that if you will. Um, some of the statistics that he was saying that especially the uploaded cost and also the time. So there's also the time value of money. So there's money and there's a high, you know, relative to these other, you know, wind or solar or natural gas. Um, it's costly. Yeah. So I'm, if anyone knows my background, I've done a lot of work on nuclear costs, and it is really complicated. So, Mark, you studied economics, so you know that price is determined by both supply and demand. And historically, nuclear power has had to compete with fossil fuels and hasn't benefited from the plethora of federal and state demand pull policies that renewables have over the last three decades. So solar panels used to be 10,000 times more expensive than they are today. Um, and they've had investment tax credits, production tax credits, renewable portfolio standards, federal procurement policies, all of which help developers innovate and ramp up factory fabrication, to which bring, brought costs down dramatically. The same could be true for nuclear. Um, in countries that had consistent demand for nuclear because they lack domestic fossil fuels, you see significant learning, standardization, and costs are much lower, even declining over time, like in South Korea. So-called advanced nuclear designs um, that are starting their first commercial demonstrations right now in the US are hoping to take advantage of modularization, factory fabrication, the way other energy technologies have, um, to hopefully reduce costs and shorten timelines. Uh, they're aiming to be cost competitive with natural gas. Of course, that has to be proven out. Um, but even with the high costs of recent builds, which Mark mentioned in Georgia and France and Finland, um, the electricity is affordable at the system level. Um, and we can see that with countries that have a lot of nuclear, like France and Sweden, have much lower electricity rates than a place that's very dependent on renewables like Denmark or Germany. In the US, electricity from existing nuclear power plants is the second cheapest source after hydroelectric. Um, and the key point is that renewables may be cheap on a per kilowatt hour basis, um, and that's great. That helps bring costs down, but system-wide, they can prove much more expensive because of that intermittency. Um, and a counterintuitive thing that happens is that as renewables have become cheaper and cheaper, they've been producing less and less value to the grid because of oversupply. So if you're already you know, 100% solar at, in the middle of the day, building more solar doesn't help. You need something that can provide electricity at night or when it's not windy. Uh, and so the more you have on the grid, the less sort of marginal value you're getting out of new projects. Mark, do you have a response? Um, yeah, so in response, well, in the first quarter of 2024, Portugal had about 80 to 90% renewables on the grid on the average, and they were one of the lowest cost uh, countries in Europe in terms of their electricity demand. In terms of excess solar or wind on the grid, so I'll point to uh, during the last, as I mentioned, California for the last 33 days, California has been at 27 days of 100% renewables for between 0.25 and six hours per day. All those days, there was excess solar or mostly solar, but other renewables on the grid. What did they do with it? Well, half went to batteries and half was exported out of state. The batteries then were used at night and so as soon as the sun went down and also in the morning, so they shoulder on the shoulders of the sunlight. So that helped to uh, supply at night. In fact, the other day there was an eclipse, right? You know what happened when the eclipse happened? The solar went down, solar production went down, batteries immediately kicked in. There, there's no, there's, because it takes only 20 milliseconds for a battery to kick in. And so there's, there's nine, around nine gigawatts of batteries on the grid in California. The demand in spring and most of the year is around 25 gigawatts. So it's on the order of you know, a third almost. In the summer, it goes up to like 50 gigawatts. But there's just a huge growth of batteries. There's a huge growth of solar and wind. And also when you have extra solar and wind, there are other things you can do with it. Because when we're electrifying all energy sectors, we're gonna need more hydrogen for steel production, ammonia production, some transport some grid electricity, so you can produce hydrogen with extra solar and wind. You can also produce heat that can be stored uh, in soil or in water or in for high temperature processes for industry in what are called fire bricks. So there's a lot of stuff you can do with uh, excess solar and wind uh, when, you need, when you have too much. So anyway, in terms of the cost, as I mentioned, in, in the United States, the, the eight, eight states that have some of the mo highest penetrations of renewables on the grid 
starting with South Dakota at the top and also Montana, uh, Washington State's another one, Iowa. The, of the, those states have among the 13 lowest electricity prices in the US. One exception, California. California has humongous electricity price and everybody blames renewables or has nothing to do with renewables on the grid in California. In fact, renewables are keeping the cost lower. It has to do with wildfires that were triggered by uh, transmission lines that pg and is then making everybody else pay for. It has to do with the Aliso Canyon gas disaster. It has to do with the San Bruno gas disaster, which killed a lot of people and destroyed a whole neighborhood. It has to do with strengthening gas lines as a result of the gas disaster. It has to do with undergrounding transmission lines. It has to do with a lot of other factors. In, and also, the, California has the second highest gas prices in the United States. So, and gas is, uses backup when you don't have renewables right now. So there are a lot of other factors that affect prices that have nothing to do with renewables on the grid. Well, it's interesting you say that because um, Ovik Roy, who's uh, with the foundation, um, he's, a, he's been an advisor to Governor Rick Perry uh, and former Governor Mitt, Mitt Romney. He's done an analysis of California energy prices, and he said a big reason why um, the average California household pays about $1,700 per year for electricity even though the average California home uses about half as much energy as the American household, and it's also got the highest poverty rate, and so the high energy bills hit poor people harder. So you've, you've actually seen a mass migration out of California. So he makes the argument, um, he says that a lot of it has to do with restrictions on natural gas, um, that the state, in order to pursue these renewable mandates, they restricted the supply or the um, you know, the, the energy for national, or the, uh, the building of natural gas. What would you say in response to that argument that you're having this big outflow of people, for the first time, California is now losing congressional seats, and, and, and top one is, a top reason is the cost of living, and, and people cite energy. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, gas prices in California are the second highest in the U.S., and so that's why we have high electricity prices. And so we want to use less gas on the grid, and renewables have the lowest prices wind and solar in particular, so, and solar in particular in California, is dirt cheap. I mean, it, and as I mentioned, all these other states, they have the lowest prices of electricity in the US and they have a huge amount of renewables on the grid. And so you can, so that you can look at a correlation map and there's the, it's, the more renewables you have, the lower your cost is, except California. But as I mentioned, that's due to all these disasters that the utilities are making us pay for. Mm -hmm. And in Michigan, uh, the governor there, Governor Whitmer, had signed a law on wind and solar energy, a mandate um, with the goal of 100% clean by 2040. Uh, they ended up rolling back some of those, those law, laws or policies. Um, and then we heard that the, the state is going to now uh, get a federal grant uh, to expand and, and bring back online a nuclear plant in Michigan. And in doing so, you had the uh, the Biden administration come in and say that nuclear is the power of the future. Our energy secretary, Granholm, said that. So what would you say to Secretary Granholm if she were here today when she's saying that nuclear power is the power of the future and looking in the context of the Biden administration, which is very pro-wind and solar as well? Well, as I mentioned, it takes at least 17 years in the United States to build a new nuclear plant, so that's not going to happen. So the only thing there that might happen is they might keep some existing nuclear reactors open. And so they're spending $1.5 billion up front for that Palisades plant to reopen it. And it's only an 800 megawatt plant. And anybody can do the math. I mean, first of all, that's 1.5 and it's expected to be a total of about $8 billion to keep that thing going. And $1.5 billion, well, that's 1.5 gigawatts of solar. And the peak power of that is already almost twice the peak power of that nuclear plant. Just taking that subsidy and just buying new solar You'd get you're not you're going to get maybe 60% of the the annual energy output with that 1.5 billion dollars of subsidy, uh, but you're going to have to replace that plant anyway. So why use the subsidy money uh, to just keep that going? And in fact, the, the company that's going to be doing it, they have no experience in nuclear, so it's estimated that'll cost about eight billion dollars to of subsidy. So with n existing nuclear plants that want if you know if they don't need subsidy, fine, keep them open. But if they need subsidy, you need to do a calculation, see, is this worth it? Because it's just a big waste of money in my mind. 
Jessica? Yeah, I just wanted to jump on a couple points. I mean, to, to Mark's point about what's filling in the gaps when renewables flows, um, there's some great tools available online to look at hourly what's generating electricity um, and emissions across states in the US um, called Electricity Mapper. And what I see in California, um, you can look at this for any given day, is that when you know the sun sets or the wind stops blowing, it's almost always filled in with natural gas. And we see this when the San Onofre nuclear power plant closed outside of San Diego, natural gas consumption shot up, emissions shot up in California. Uh, and we see that in a lot of states when nuclear power plants close or other countries like in Germany uh, when nuclear power plants close. And so I think for now at least, you know, maybe in the future renewables can fill in that gap, but right now natural gas is filling in when nuclear closes and when renewables um, have a shortfall. Um, and to the point about, uh, you know, policy changes, not just in Michigan, but in California, we've had a huge shift on nuclear. So the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant was supposed to close this year and next year. Um, it got a sort of stay of execution for five years, and that was because we didn't have enough power on the grid. Um, even with all the natural gas capacity we have, we're having shortfalls in the summer facing power outages. Um, and the governor, who's you know, been very anti-nuclear his whole life, um, had to make this change really to, you know, save um, the country, and particularly because of high energy prices. I mean, high energy prices are a big political issue, but also power outages, which have huge economic repercussions, just unacceptable. And you're seeing this across country, across states, even with high deployment of renewables, a lot of utilities are going to their state public utilities commission saying, we need more natural gas capacity. We're falling short. This was Gavin, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom's argument as well, is that batteries aren't coming online as fast as we thought. Renewables are coming online as fast as we caught. We need something to fill the gap, at least for the next five years and, and maybe longer. And so Mark brought up the issue of safety. So Jessica, I'd, I want to talk about that with you. So, I mean, you've got massive headlines from Chernobyl in 1986 in Ukraine, uh, the Three Mile Island, and then Fukushima in Japan as a result of, of a tsunami from an earthquake. Um, and you're, you know, tens of billions of dollars in damage um, and health risks. Uh, on the plane over here, I actually uh, was telling my seatmate about the debate. And it turns out he's from Ontario, Canada, and he lives right near the Pickering nuclear plant. And he was telling me that his family is uh, on a regular basis getting tablets from the government, uh, potassium iodide tablets. Uh, because it protects the, the thyroid gland against internal uptake of uh, these radioactive materials in the case of an accident. Um, so that's part of the normal rhythm of their life. And he grew up about 10 miles, and now he lives even closer. Um, so is that normal? Is that something that people should be willing to sacrifice their, their physical safety? Um, and, and then just, just to see the loss of uh, money and, and just the unpredictability uh, of the potential of, of these accidents. Yeah, so I'll just agree with people's concerns in that the idea of a nuclear accident is really scary, um, particularly seeing these, these high-profile accidents. Um, but they're also super rare in terms of nuclear's history. Nuclear has historically been one of the safest energy technologies. Um, and uh, that's even including those major accidents. I mean, no one died at Three Mile Island. No one died at Fukushima from radiation. There were people that drowned in the tsunami. Um, and the analogy that I like to make is um, it's like air travel. We see these accidents. You know, planes occasionally fall out of the sky. Just recently in the news, there's been all these troubles with Boeing aircraft. Um, and it's really scary. Um, but if you look at the data, you know that air travel is the safest mode of transportation, much, much safer than driving. And it's very similar with nuclear. There are these really scary accidents that happen, but it's so much safer than just our everyday exposure to air pollution from fossil fuels to coal. Uh, and so that is mainly what nuclear has replaced on energy systems is fossil fuels. And so that's really what we're comparing with. And when you look at life cycle assessments of mortality and morbidity, nuclear often comes out even safer than something like hydro, which has catastrophic dam failures. Uh, solar has a lot of you know, difficult chemicals involved in the production. Um, so it's really tough to grapple with some of those fears. Um, but nuclear actually is very safe. And then I did just want to touch on new technologies, um, which are even safer. 
Um, but for very good reasons. You don't just have to take my word for it. Um, a lot of the what we call advanced nuclear technologies rely on intrinsic or passive safety features. So this is things that res, uh, rely on laws of physics rather than engineered safety systems, things like convective cooling that doesn't need pumps or accident tolerant fuels, liquid fuels that can't melt because they're already liquid. Um, and what's interesting is that relying on physical processes for safety instead of engineering systems can also make the technology cheaper because it's much simpler, um, easier to fabricate, um, easier to come up with components for. Um, and so that's really the hope with new nuclear technologies. Uh, is that they can be both safer and cheaper because of um, you know better physics, better um, safety systems. And uh, I, I'd love for Mark to respond to that. But before related on the safety question, I know Mark has written about the issue of nuclear war and the technology is uh, transferable or used by state actors or non-state actors who might uh, cause a lot of significant terrorism damage. Um, or you could have a terrorist attack on a nuclear plant and cause significant danger as well. Uh, I think in general, the, you know, kind of the anti-nuclear movement, a lot of it is based on concerns of states uh, like Iran or Pakistan or uh, even China um, that are not allies of the United States, that, that this, you know, the more we subsidize this type of technology, the more we're putting our own safety at risk. Yeah, so historically, there has been a connection between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. There's no denying that. But it's a lot weaker than people think. Um, for almost all countries that have nuclear weapons, they got the weapons first, and then they developed nuclear power later. Um, and really, most of the risk of proliferation, what the word we use for you know, nuclear material being used to make weapons, comes from the fuel cycle, not from the power plant. Um, things like uranium enrichment or re fuel reprocessing. Um, and so it's, it's really those facilities we need to watch. And there are really strong international regulations on that. Um, there's a, the um, International Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. It's the most successful arm tre arms treaty in terms of countries adhering to it. Um, there's the International Atomic Energy Agency, which provides oversight and inspections. They have people located in every facility, every nuclear facility around the world. Um, and the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which controls um, commercial technology or trade in commercial technology. So there's really good regulation. I'm not saying that you know there's no risk, um, but we have really good regimes in place to monitor these. So if a country, let's say Iran, says they really want to do enrichment, that raises a lot of red flags. We want to send in inspectors. If they say we're kicking out the inspectors, OK, now we know something's going on. We're going to put sanctions on them. And that's the system we have in place. So for the most part, you know, enrichment facilities, recycling facilities are in countries that we really trust and that allow inspectors in um, that have 24-hour sort of monitoring of all the processes and we can keep it safe. So um, it's not something I worry about day to day. And you can look at this even with you know, a country like Ukraine that has a ton of nuclear power in the middle of a war zone. They're in talks right now to build more nuclear power when the conflict is over. And so they're obviously you know, comfortable with that risk because for them, the alternative is being dependent on Russian natural gas. And that's just not an option for them. Mark. Lots to respond to. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good, let's hear it. <laughs> well, first, I just want to point out, so these technologies, these new technologies, they don't actually exist in terms of any commercial reactors yet. These are proposed technologies. And they won't be around, at least in terms of even testing, till 2030 or so. So again, we have a problem of time lag between planning and operation makes it not useful to, because commercializing these wouldn't even be till the late 19, uh, 2030s. But these are all also small modular reactors. Think about it. And these are reactors that some countries want to put on a boat and then and they are, some of them are on boats now. And you can actually move them around. You can tape, put them in any country you want. There are only around 30 countries right now that have nuclear reactors for energy. There are 200 countries in the world. If we want to expand nuclear energy, every country is going to want to do it, right? And if we're, or at least if we're pushing that technology, every country is going to want to do it. So you can, you can imagine these small modular reactors going into dozens of countries, more dozens more countries, or even 100 more countries, not saying all of them or very many would want to convert into weapons. Uh, the, you know, it's really like once you have nuclear energy, it gives you an excuse to import uranium or, and refine it or reprocess and to develop weapons. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on 
And climate change says there's, with robust evidence and high agreement, there's a strong correlation between nuclear energy and nuclear weapons proliferation. So small modular reactors, they're basically nuclear weapons in a box. You're going to be transporting them, transporting the ability or at least the motivation to develop weapons into many more countries of the world. May not be the biggest problem in the world, but it is a problem. Uh, but yeah, so in terms of which countries have developed weapons, well, yeah, some of them have used test reactors, uh, and like Iraq before 1982, before the reactor was destroyed by Israel, was, you know, they had a test reactor. Um, India and Pakistan, well, India used had nuclear energy and then developed weapons. Um, you know, there's different countries like Syria, uh, Venezuela once has been talking about de developing, uh, getting reactors for energy. Uh, we know in Iran, they've been using energy, nuclear energy, as a kind of a foil for reprocessing or highly enriching uranium. Anyway, so it's a, it's a risk. You don't have this risk with clean renewable energy, uh, but that's not the only risk as we've talked about. That's just one of many risks. Great, I got one more question for you, Mark, and then we're gonna turn the audience questions. I've got some, a great question list here. I've got 27 responses so far, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fire as many quickly as I can, rapid fire to you both. But I wanted to ask you, Mark, about uh, the question of, because right now, um, all of the plants are uh, um, fission-based. What, what's your take on fusion? Because the US government has gotten into this. Um, would, you be, would you be more open to the idea of fusion-based? Do you think it's practical? Do you think it has a future? And if so, would you be more supportive of that uh, versus fission? Yeah, well, fusion doesn't have a lot of the radioactive waste problems. It doesn't have the radioactive waste problems as fission. and doesn't have weapons proliferation issues. The problem with fusion is it's just never gonna happen on a scale that we need it in the time we need it. It's just, you know, you need a huge amount of energy to get a tiny amount of energy. And that's what all they're getting right now is a tiny, tiny amount of energy after an input of a huge amount of energy. You need to, you need temperatures of 100 million degrees. And that takes a lot of energy to get that. And they're getting just tiny amounts of energy. So it's just not gonna happen. I mean, it's always 30 years away. And we don't have time. We have six years to solve 80% of the problem. We need to focus on what works. That's where we should be spending our money. We have a limited amount of resources, time, money, and equipment. And, and so we need to focus on what works and not waste time on things that might work sometime in the future. Great. All right, we're going to go rapid fire. Now I've got 30 questions, so this is great. I'm going to get to as many as we can. Um, Jessica, you brought up this issue of uh, Ukraine. And so someone asked about the Chemerare retrofit of a coal plant uh, to a small nuclear a, a facility was stopped by the Ukraine war as the fuel was coming from Russia. What is the status of availability of nuclear fuel around that right now? Yeah, so it wasn't stopped. Um, they're having some issues. So really quickly, um, there's a company called TerraPower. It's known for being highly uh, funded by Bill Gates. Um, they're developing one of these advanced reactors. Um, it's a very different technology, but they're building their first demonstration project. Um, they just announced they submitted their license application um, in a town called Cumber, Wyoming, that has a coal plant that's closing, um, and they're building at that site. Now, a lot of the advanced nuclear technologies, including TerraPower, were using a different kind of fuel um, called high assay, low enriched uranium. Um, it's just sort of a uh, creamier nuclear fuel, basically. It's higher enrichment. Um, and formerly, um, the only place you could get that fuel was from Russia. Uh, Russia hasn't cut off supply necessarily, um, but advanced reactor developers in the U.S. are saying they're not going to get the, their fuel from Russia. Um, and so they're looking for alternative supply. The Biden administration has, and Congress, have um, authorized a lot of money to stimulate, incentivize domestic production of HALU in the U.S. And actually, just a couple months ago, the first um, enrichment plant in the U.S. to produce HALU came online. Um, so we're working on scaling up the supply. Um, an interesting kind of proliferation point I just wanted to touch on is that the reason the U.S. imports all of its nuclear fuel, which most people don't know, um, is that uh, domestic production really trailed off um, in the last 30 years. And the reason for that is that we had this treaty um, with Russia for 20 years where Russia would decommission nuclear weapons, weapons-grade material, turn it into fuel for commercial nuclear reactors, and the U.S. Um, was required to purchase it by this treaty and use it in our own nuclear power plants. And for 20 years, about 
10% of all US electricity was actually coming from decommissioned nuclear weapons, which I think is really cool. Very interesting. Okay, Mark, we've got a few questions. I'm going to combine them. Folks asking about uh, the the account for how do you take into account the need for petroleum-based products uh, behind the wind energy uh, for output uh, estimations, and then also the lifetime carbon impact, including the mining, transport, and installation, uh, and pollution from mining. Um, and there's also the safety issue around using slave labor with the Uyghur population in China, who are you know used to being used forcibly to create a, get a lot of the critical minerals and uh, things used for EV batteries. So you're getting a lot of questions about that. Oh, so these are questions about renewable energy? Yes. Okay. Um, well, so the mining issue. So fossil fuels, you need to mine, transport, and refine them every day forever, right? I mean, there are, every year in the United States, there are 50,000 new oil and gas wells. And I know if you're around here, heard about 50,000 new oil and gas wells are drilled every year. The U.S. has 1.3 million active oil and gas wells, 3.2 million abandoned ones. Uh, the fossil fuel industry occupies 1.3% of all U.S. land area, and that's growing every year because of the continuous need for more fuels. So when you go to renewables, you eliminate the need for everyday fuels because all the fuel comes from the sun, the wind, the water, the heat in the ground. And so you have much less mining. You go down two orders of magnitude in mining, like one one hundredth the amount of mining. So they're still mining, but it's much less. So, but it's mining for the infrastructure, not for continuous fuels that you need every day. With fossil fuels or nuclear, you also need mining for infrastructure as well. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of mining. Um, in terms of what, what materials, I mean, some people will say, oh, cobalt's a problem with batteries because of the slave labor in Africa. But you know, Tesla makes batteries now with no cobalt. So there's different options uh, for different fuels. Lithium, you might think, OK, well, you have to mine a lot of lithium. Well, yeah, but now lithium has been recycled. Uh, Redwood Materials is a startup um, that they recycle like 96 to 98% of materials and batteries. Uh, Sonnen is a battery company. They, they uh, recycle all their materials and all their batteries. So lithium, yeah, you'll need to one-time mine it, and, but then it's, now it's being recycled. Um, in fact, most all lithium, the Salton Sea in California is estimated to contain enough lithium for maybe all of US lithium needs. But there are already geothermal plants there in the Salton Sea, geothermal electricity generated plants that bring up the hot brine from down below. And they, that contains lithium. So you can actually extract that lithium from the same brine that's used to create geothermal electricity without any new mining. They have a plant like that in a similar situation in Germany in one place. And the point is, is the mining is much, much less with renewables, and the recycling is going to be the norm. It's not, not everything's recycled now, but it will be. And so I'm less concerned about that because we're eliminating all the air pollution from, the, from combustion. We're also limiting air pollution, combustion, climate relevant emissions. We're reducing our energy needs. When you electrify all energy worldwide, you reduce your power demand about 56% because electric heat pumps are more efficient than combustion heating. Electric vehicles use one fourth the energy as gasoline or diesel vehicles. Uh, electrified industry uses about 5% less en energy than combustion industry. 12% of all energy worldwide is used to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels in uranium. You don't need that in the system. When you add it all up and you add additional energy, use energy efficiency improvements, you get a 56% reduction of power demand. So compared to what we have today, so much less energy is needed, and we don't need continuous fuel, so much less mining is needed. So the whole thing is going to cost a lot less, because even if the cost per unit energy were the same, you have 56% less energy that you're needing. And so you're spending 56% less in the annual average. But in fact, renewables now are the cheapest form of new electricity in the world. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, in the summer of 2022, a high proportion of the nuclear reactors in France had to be shut down due to low water levels in rivers caused by drought. Will nuclear power plants become less reliable sources of power as the planet warms and droughts become more frequent? Very interesting question. Yeah, um, that's you know also an issue for plants in the U.S., not just water levels, but also water temperature reduces um, the amount of power you can produce at any kind of thermal plant, not just nuclear. 
Um, there are ways that their um, nuclear power um, operators around the world are looking to make plants more resilient to changes in climate. Um, you can you know, change where you're drawing an intake water. Um, you can move more towards dry cooling systems or hybrid cooling systems. A lot of the new nuclear power plants that are breaking ground in the US now are looking at doing a lot more water recycling. So they're not drawing fresh water um, from, from lakes and rivers. If your nuclear power plant is on the ocean, this is much less of an issue that water is coming up, not going down. Um, but I did just want to touch on that this is not just an issue for nuclear. We're seeing a lot of impacts on hydroelectric generation from drought. Um, this is a big deal in California, um, but also wildfire smoke is obscuring sunlight, reducing solar output. Um, there's wind lulls from changing weather patterns. So this is something that all energy technologies are really grappling with and energy systems modelers are incorporating it more and more. I think something that's really attractive about new nuclear designs is that a lot of them um, have much lower water consumption. Um, and then some technologies are moving to an air cooling system. So more like a natural gas uh, turbine where they're not using any water either for primary or secondary cooling, they're air cooled. Um, and so that's really, going to open up nuclear to more places that don't have easy access to surface water. Uh, Mark, I'm getting several questions for you uh, asking about why not an all the above? So why single out nuclear uh, to be opposed to as opposed to kind of doing a multi front strategy here? Well, so again, I, like I focus on trying to understand or solve air pollution, global warming and energy security problems simultaneously and having knowing that it takes, well, we need to solve these problems immediately and as soon as possible. And it's such a large problem to solve worldwide. I mean, there's so much energy being used and there's so many people on this planet. And we, we just have to focus on what works. We cannot waste time on technologies that may work, that cost a lot more or have impacts that are uh, much greater than other technologies we, if we want to solve the problem the most efficiently, we want to focus on the technologies that can be implemented quickly and at scale as fast as possible and have the least risk. And so, yeah, nuclear is kind of on the margin. I, as I said, existing nuclear, okay, it's fine as long as it doesn't require subsidy. But new nuclear, I mean, it doesn't really matter what I think. It's just not going to be built. It's just, it's just not happening. It's never, it, not a single reactor ever built in the world has taken less than 10 years between planning and operation. And the, the range has typically been 10 to 19 years, but now in North America and Europe, as I mentioned, it's now like 17 to 22 years. The rest of the world's still about 12 to up to 22 years. So it's just not gonna happen. So why would we spend money on something that's not gonna happen? I mean, politicians should be able to see this. They've just, all you have to do is look at not only the reactor in Georgia, how long it took and how much it costs. Why would we spend more money on that unless you don't think there's the problem serious? If you don't, you know, we could, if we don't care about the problem, sure, let's just burn more coal, burn more gas, use more nuclear, that's fine. But if we really want to solve these problems, we need to focus on what works and implement them as soon as possible. Uh, there's just no time to waste. Last year was the warmest year in recorded history. Uh, I mean, not in the human kind, I mean, not in world history. I mean, four billion years ago, four and a half billion years ago, the earth was molten. But 100 million years ago, we had no ice. But in, re in human history, Last year was the warmest year. It was 1.46 degrees warmer than the 1900 to 1930 period. And we're trying to avoid 1.5 degrees global warming. So, I mean, that's maybe not the average, but it's the, before that, we were around, around 1.2 degrees. Now that was 1.46. That's a wake up call that things are happening much faster than even <laughs> most, uh, the most optimistic or pessimistic computer modelers had estimated. So this is a serious problem. It requires serious solutions and focusing on what works and not wasting time on things that are marginal. Yeah, this is great. You guys got 45 questions now. This is good. I'm, I'm, you guys are an active audience. It's great. Um, Jessica, how do you intend to shift public perception regarding nuclear waste and demonstrate the safety of its disposal for, disposal for nearby communities? My family's from Utah, and I know in, in Nevada, it's an even bigger issue. Um, that and it's a big political issue. Um, just the waste to like to perceive that there's some states in in the United States that that we perceive as our dumping ground, and we can just dump this material there. Um, 
what do you say to that? And, and it's and it's a long it's a long half life. Um, what's your response to this about the, the disposal? Yeah. So a couple of things. I think the the big challenge with nuclear waste is that we in the U.S. don't have a plan for it, and people see that and it feels very wrong, and it is. Um, we need to come up with a solution for what to do with the waste in the U.S. However, it is entirely a political problem, not a technical problem. Uh, the U.S. went chose a very poor process for how to site their geologic repository in Nevada. They did it mostly because no one lived there and they didn't have a lot of political power and they kind of, you're right, just dumped it out there or that was the plan. Um, what you see in other countries who've had a lot more progress on siting a repository for nuclear waste, places like France, um, but especially Sweden and Finland, um, where I'm much more familiar, is they used um, what we call now a consent-based siting process or even a reverse auction. So in Sweden, um, just for some context, my husband and daughter are both dual citizens with Sweden. Um, and uh, they said, okay, we want to site a repository. Um, who, who wants to host it? Uh, let's talk. And they sent out an invitation letter to every single municipality in the country. And you might be surprised that countries volunteered, but it, of course they did because it would come with a lot of funding and a lot of benefits. And they got to negotiate uh, with the nuclear power plant, with the industry, about what they would get in return for hosting a facility. And not surprising, the communities that were most interested were ones that hosted nuclear power plants because they already had that material in their area. They wanted to be involved. They wanted to help um, you know, the industry be sustainable. Uh, and so they moved forward. They chose a site. The site that didn't get selected was actually really disappointed, and they got a huge payout anyway because they you know, didn't get to benefit from this repository. Finland, similar process. Um, France, um, same thing, but what's interesting is that France um, recycles all of their spent fuel at least once, um, and that's something that the U.S. hasn't done, uh, mainly for economic reasons. Um, it doesn't solve the nuclear waste problem. You still need a repository to put that really long-lived stuff, but it does help really reduce the volume of nuclear waste and also the toxicity, so it's radioactive for less time. Um, and so there's a lot of private interest right now in the U.S. on recycling, and what we're seeing is a lot of communities that might be interested in hosting uh, uh, interim storage for nuclear waste um, are much more interested if it could also be sort of a R&D innovation center that was also doing recycling or research on recycling. Um, and just a couple months ago, there was an announcement um, from the Biden administration that there's going to be a pilot commercial plant for uh, nuclear waste reprocessing built in the U.S. Um, just in the next couple of years. So stuff's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm getting some questions for Mark uh, just overall about the, again, it's kind of more broad. I, I think the question should be more nuclear specific, but I think it's, it's interesting, I think in the broader context of what you're saying of, of the what, what you describe as a short timeline to uh, to solve uh, the to mitigate environmental issues. Um, China and India are, you know, throwing up new coal plants uh, quite rapidly and and they're really not doing much. I mean, they, get, they, they talk a good game, China especially, about wanting to do more. Um, so even if we, if the U.S. were to try to do full, you know, breakneck, uh, breakneck speed. What about uh, China and India? Yeah. So actually, five years ago, that might have been true. But today, actually, China. Last year, China installed more solar than the rest of the world combined, and they've installed more wind than they have the greatest amount of wind power installed. They, is it offsetting the the coal and and? Yeah, they, they are increasing the coal, but it's a, it's a tiny amount compared to the increases in solar and wind that they're adding. And and they do have, they actually have compressed their tire line to phase it out. So if China's actually, in terms of their electric power, in fact, I did an analysis looking at comparing different countries, and China is 26%, or at least that was, and that's only in 2022 because they don't, that was the data that were available. 26% just wind, water, and solar. So solar, wind, geothermal, and hydroelectric. The US is 22, 23%. So China actually has a higher percent of their grid that's just clean renewable energy than the United States does. And in fact, as I mentioned, there are, well, there are 47 countries in the world that are between 50 and 100% just wind, water, and solar on their electric grid in the annual average. Most of them are small countries. There are seven that are actually 99.8% to 100%. And 
you know, most of them are dominated by hydro, right? Like there's uh, Albania, for example, Paraguay, Bhutan, Nepal, but also Norway, Costa Rica, Iceland. They're all virtually 100% renewable in their annual average. The, US, the United States is around 23%. Uh, you know, Japan's like 22%, but China's 26%. So, every, you know, the biggest countries, China emits about one third of all the world emissions. So, you know, they need to be on board. You know, India is growing also, they're close to 20%. So they're, they have, they are, have a lot of commitments. Not to say they, they also have a long way to go. They're nowhere close. And by the way, in electricity, I should also point out, I don't want to make this sound too good because electricity is only 20% of all end use energy. We also need to, to change transportation, buildings, and industry. Those are the main other sectors. And so when I say, you know, we're, there are countries that are 100%, that's just the electric power sector. All these other sectors, transportation, industry, buildings, they need to be transitioned. This is why this problem is so huge. We need to just focus on what works and can't focus on technologies that aren't going to be available for 10, 20 years. So related to that, there's a question here, and I, I'm, not the, I'm not sure the source of this, but I'm throwing it out there because it sounds interesting. So tell me, um, this question says, it's frequently noted that a solar farm 125 miles square would provide all the power our country needs. It would be cheaper and faster to pursue that goal than building a bunch of nuclear reactors. Is it, what's the source? Have you heard of that study? Um, I've heard numbers like that. I think um, the the challenges of intermittency and balancing the grid and transmission are are why we're not doing that automatically. Right, but in terms of it is a lot cheaper and it's a lot faster, to Mark's point, that it's a lot easier to build you know, a solar farm than it is to build a nuclear reactor. I think, you know, if that were true, we'd already see it <laughs> happen. Uh, these, these grid reliability issues are a serious problem that utilities are facing. You know, where the renewable resources are, where the wind is, is not where the demand is, which is in cities. Um, and so moving it. I mean, Mark cited these numbers of how long it takes, you know, to plan and um, do the licensing and construction of a nuclear power plant. It looks like a long time. Um, when you look at similar, um, when you look at the whole life cycle of a renewables project, it can also be really long. I mean, look at Cape Wind and offshore wind in the U.S. These, you know, we've been waiting on these for decades. They're getting canceled left and right. Um, if you look at just construction time, you know, in South Korea, it's four years to build a one gigawatt nuclear power plant. And when you look at historically um, how long it's taken countries to build out large fleets of clean energy, all kinds of clean energy, nuclear always comes in as the fastest deployed. Um, and that's because it's so much energy provided. Even in the UAE, they went from, you know, 0% nuclear to 20% of their electricity coming from nuclear in just 10 years. Um, and that's very amazing. That's a very, you know, wealthy country. They had a lot of resources to put into it. Um, but it's, again, looking at, like, the system-wide, how long does it take? And, and that's where nuclear can be faster. And I just want to touch on this point of, like, it's not going to be ready until the 2030s. I, you know, that's true. Um, these tech, some of these advanced technologies are just getting, you know, just breaking ground on their first commercial-scale demonstrations. But we're still going to need more energy, <laughs> more electricity in 2030 to 2050. We have nuclear power plants that are going to be retiring. We have renewable projects that are going to be retiring we need to completely decarbonize electricity, but also transportation, industry, uh, home heating, and that's going to increase demand for electricity. After 2030, after 2050, we'll still be increasing demand for electricity. And so that's where I'm not, you know, I think we need all of the above. Um, I think we're going to need new, new technologies in the future um, to reduce the impacts on ecosystems. Uh, and also the climate. And so even if something's not going to be right until the 2030s, I think it's still worth pursuing. Okay. I'm going to ask Mark one more question, and then we'll move to our closing statements. Um, so a few questions have asked about smaller nuclear plants. Would it be possible to build them more quickly? And then also other questions about converting existing coal plants and retrofitting them to be nuclear plants. Would that make things the timeline more compressed? Um, no, I think, well, first of all, before we have new, had large nuclear reactors, we started with small reactors, and because they were too expensive and economies of scale, uh, so the economies of scale resulted in larger reactors because they're cheaper. And now we're going back to smaller reactors, but, and the problem with smaller reactors, I mean, there are a lot of problems, but their costs are still high. And in fact, the only company that had a nuclear reactor design approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, New Scale, they 
we're supposed to um, have a they're supposed to have a reactor test reactor available by 2029 or 2030, and they had a bunch of uh, con a consortium in Utah where people were going to buy their power, but because costs escalated, that consortium disbanded and they canceled the project, and New Scale stock tanked, and then they were sued for fraud, and now you know they're still in business, but they're pushing back the times until 2030, 2031, could be 2032. I mean, there's, you know, all these dates are promises. You know, one thing with nuclear, whatever date is promised, you know it's going to be later. And, you know, with regard to like those times that were cited here, those are construction times. Those aren't planning to operation times. There's no reactor in history that's ever been built from planning to operation in less than 10 years. The UAE reactors, as I mentioned, they're between 11 and 15 years but for the four reactors, each one. And every, every country, it's, it's, you have to plan to operate. In California, 12% of all the electricity generated in California in 2023 was rooftop solar. And that is not even counted on, as grid electricity. That reduces demand on the grid, and so it causes during the day the demand to go down. And that was all that rooftop solar is just put in you know, anywhere from six months to a year between planning and operation. Uh, and I know because I did myself, I put rooftop solar, that's how long it takes. And you can do that in Colorado. And in Colorado, it's about 6% utility scale solar, 3% rooftop solar. But I mean, you can look at Grand Junction, they have lots of rooftops, plenty of space, little objection, I'm sure. And a cheap way to provide your own electricity. Like in California, it costs 67 cents a kilowatt hour now in peak time of day. And you know, even though the solar only costs three cents a kilowatt hour, and that's because of all these additional costs. But if you have your own solar on your roof, it's free. Well, not free, then you pay for it, but it's, it's the cost of that solar to put in was 10 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So you're paying 10 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour to put in your own solar, and you're saving, you're not paying 67 cents a kilowatt hour. Same thing in Colorado. You're gonna, whatever, I don't know what the price of electricity is here, but you can put in your own rooftop solar on, when you amortize it out, it's gonna be 10 to 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And if the, your price of grid electricity is higher than that, you're making money. So that's one way to do it on a large scale. There's a lot more rooftop solar. Utility solar doesn't take up a lot of land, even though it, we, we calculated to power the entire US, it would take up about 0.9% of US land area, less than the 1.3% that the fossil fuel industry occupies. So anyway, I've gone too long. Right. Yeah, no, thank you, Mark. <laughs> All right, five minutes. Uh, we'll do closing okay. statements and uh, Jessica, Oh, we do? Oh, okay. okay, I thought we were wrapping up, sorry. Oh, we're okay. Oh, okay. Um, well, then we'll keep going. Um, so, um, in terms of the um, the permitting, so you you had mentioned the permitting issue that it's um, uh, a problem that a lot of people are opposed to nuclear um, and that the permitting issue, you, you say that that's a political issue um, not a technical issue that it's uh, people are opposed um, because they don't want a nuclear site in their facility. I was actually talking about renewables. <laughs> okay. Um, well, uh, but I mean, it, it is true that uh, nuclear permits face a lot of opposition as well. Not, it's not really a permitting issue for nuclear. I mean, if you look at uh, the communities that surround existing nuclear power plants, they're super supportive of nuclear power generally um, because they get a lot of benefits out of it. And for new plants, um, community opposition is not uh, an issue with the permitting um, because these are communities that you know, are looking for diversification in their economies. They have coal power plants closing. Um, so it's not really an issue. Um, permitting and permitting reform is a big issue right now for renewables, but not really for nuclear. So in terms of the, but but just the, the broader sense that you did mention in your opening statement that there, and several questions have kind of touched on this, that uh, the reason why people are opposed to nuclear, like you mentioned public sentiment, mm -hmm. there's that it's rising. Um, in some, some instances uh, because of questions around safety. And so, I mean, we touched on sort of the issues of safety in this debate, but I want to get your thoughts about sort of why, why, why is the public moving in that direction? 
So what we've seen and, and polling, and we've commissioned polling, but there's a lot of you know national polling on, on sentiment around energy, um, people are actually pretty apathetic on nuclear. There's not really strong opinions, and opinions have been moving more positive over time um, in support of nuclear. Uh, and the main reason for that is really climate change, um, especially with younger generations. They see that as, as the much bigger concern. Um, you know, they're not as familiar with some of these nuclear accidents that happened in the past. Uh, and so that's the direction we've been seeing it going in. Um, and even, you know, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, very progressive, uh, Green New Deal um, supporter. She says Green New Deal is open to nuclear. We might need nuclear going forward. These big climate activists like Greta Thunberg in Sweden has said, you know, nuclear needs to be on the table for serious action on climate. So those sorts of voices... Um, are kind of shifting public perception of nuclear over time. I think the main obstacle, you know, I agree with Mark, I think it's cost. <laughs> I think there's a lot of ways to bring costs down. Um, I think it's still really important for uh, affordability, but public opposition really hasn't been an obstacle, I would say, for nuclear um, recently. Mm -hmm. um, and Mark, you have a question on, so we had talked about the, the waste uh, of the nuclear waste, but uh, a question here was asking about, well, what about the, the waste of the renewables? So they gave the example of, you know, like a, a defunct, um, you know, wind turbine that needs to be, um, and then there's also some habitat risk as well. Well, again, there's a, n nobody likes to add anything to the environment. If we could not add anything, that's fine. But you have to look at the trade-off. As I mentioned, fossil fuels, you have continuous mining, refining, combustion, pollution, damage to wildlife, damage to humans. You know, seven million people die a year from fossil fuel and biofuel air pollution worldwide. Yeah, with wind turbines, you're gonna have some waste, but a wind turbine lasts 30 years. And then, okay, well, then you have blades. Okay, they might, some, some of them are being recycled now. And, but in the worst case, let's say they're going to a landfill. It's a trivial amount of waste compared to all that waste from fossil fuel industry that we're displacing, we're eliminating. So, in, but recycling is becoming a norm in everything renewable, batteries, storage, uh, components of solar panels, wind turbines. I think General Electric even has, you know, just trying to recycle wind turbines. And there's some in Sweden, they have like wooden wind turbines so that they can be recycled. I'm not saying that we have a solution to every, every recycling problem. I mean, there's going to be some issues, but I'm just saying that that's a, Trivial issue in comparison. In terms of birds, I mean, people all say wind turbines kill birds. Yeah, they do, but so do cats. Um, cats kill wind turbines, according to the Fish and Wildlife Service, kill about maybe 700,000 birds a year in the United States. Communication towers kill about 10 to 50 million bird, birds a year. Buildings kill a billion birds a year. Cats, 3 billion. So it's, it's all a question of scale. Coal and gas killed 10 times the number of birds per kilowatt hour of electricity as wind, from air pollution, from buildings, from mining. And this one study, I'm not saying it's going to be accurate, I'm not trying to dis nuclear, but it was about the same number of deaths from nuclear for birds, <laughs> per, unit energy, per unit energy. I mean, you could take it with a grain of salt, but that's what the study said. So, I'm, but the point is, it's not a, yeah, there's always going to be some problem with every energy technology, but the question is, what is the minimum? What's the technology that gives you the fastest, most benefit, the least amount of time, least cost? Great. Well, thank you. Um, and I tried to get as many questions in as we as possible, but there's still a lot more. So please come to the reception afterward and ask. Keep asking your questions. We will now move to closing <laughs> statements. <laughs> Um, so this has been a really enjoyable conversation and engaging on these issues. And I hope that the main takeaway for you from this debate is that all energy sources um, have upsides and downsides. There's no you know, perfect technology. And even if you don't care about climate change, uh, you can see the impact of fossil fuels on public health, on the local environment, on air pollution. And we've seen these amazing cost declines and deployment of renewable energy, but they have challenges in terms of land use, critical minerals consumption, and their intermittency. Nuclear has also issues, well-known issues around waste, costs, perceived risks, but it also provides unique benefits um, in terms of how clean and reliable it is. So uh, just like with an investment portfolio, I think it's really important that you diversify to mitigate risks. So we're going to need a lot more 
um, of all clean energy technologies, including nuclear, to continue to provide affordable, reliable, and increasingly clean energy for decades to come. Nuclear has a tiny physical footprint, uh, actually lower life cycle emissions than even renewables. I know Mark gave different numbers, but the IPCC, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, has found that life cycle emissions from nuclear are actually lower uh, than wind and solar. Now, that doesn't really matter. They're all much, much, much lower than fossil fuels. Um, but still, you know, life cycle, looking at mining and everything, um, still very clean. Um, advanced nuclear technologies that are breaking ground today in the U.S. promise to be safer, produce less waste, be cheaper, faster to build. Of course, we shouldn't, you know, just accept those promises. We want to see the proof. We want to, you know, kick the tires on these new projects. Um, but I believe that our time is much better spent mitigating the challenges of all these energy technologies um, rather than pitting renewable against nuclear. We need both, and we need a lot more of both uh, and faster. So the, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine really laid bare the risks to Europe in at their economy and their way of life from being overly reliant on imported Russian natural gas. So a lot of countries in Europe we saw pivoted quick on nuclear, uh, whether it was delaying phase outs, keeping plants operating longer, um, or even starting to plan new builds. I think a really interesting case is Sweden. Um, they actually had a national referendum on nuclear in 1992 um, because of the Chernobyl accident. They were very close. They felt that risk very uh, uh, intimately. Uh, and the country voted to phase out nuclear by 2010. Okay, 2010 came and went. Sweden is still 40% nuclear. Uh, because of climate change, because of concerns around grid reliability, around um, dependency on fossil fuels, uh, they've extended the lifetime of their plants. And now they're even looking at building new plants at existing sites or maybe new sites. Um, and that's entirely because of uh, realities on the ground around what's possible. Um, in December of last year at the you know, big annual International Climate Conference, COP28, um, we saw 22 countries pledge uh, to triple global nuclear capacity by 2050. And this is countries as diverse as France and Jamaica, Japan and Ghana, all committed to this goal. So nationally here, the Biden administration has been a strong supporter of nuclear. Along with a Republican-led Congress, um, they've enacted lots of policies to help prevent premature closures of existing nuclear, uh, extend lifetimes economically of existing plants, but also to finance and support new innovative nuclear technologies, particularly at the sites of existing coal power plants or retiring coal power plants, um, which is a really attractive opportunity. And it's also something that's being explored here in Colorado. Uh, so to close, I think the American economy is really powered by cheap and reliable energy, um, but it's also critical to our independence, as, as you know, Mark mentioned, um, energy security. The reason that countries like U.S., Japan, France built these huge fleets of nuclear power in the 70s had nothing to do with the environment. Uh, it was about the oil crisis and the need for energy independence. And I think something that's important here is an underappreciated value of investing in domestic nuclear technology is its use as a tool of international diplomacy. So there are over 30 countries right now that are pursuing their first commercial nuclear power plants. And uh, they're all gonna import their first reactors. And if uh, 40 years ago, the US was the dominant exporter of nuclear technology, but now all of these countries are looking to partner with Russia or China to get their nuclear. And if the US isn't engaged on the world stage, we're ceding that leadership and that important role that we've played in the past. So the goal is really shifting from energy independence to energy interdependence with our democratic allies. So the question is, how can we collaborate to innovate and expand equitable and just deployment of a diverse portfolio of clean energy, which is going to include nuclear? Um, and I think it's clear that nuclear power will be a really critical component of that vision. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. Mark, you get the last word. Okay. Well, let me just give you an illustration of why th this is not helpful at all. Um, new nuclear is not helpful at all. Take the Vogel plant. So I said 18 years from planning to operation, $35 billion. If you spent that $35 billion, today's prices on wind or solar, we get 35 gigawatts, okay, versus 2.2 .2 gigawatts of the nuclear. And you would have got it like instead of 18 years, you would have gotten it 13 years ago. So for 13, 
years, there was emissions from the background grid of coal and gas while we're waiting around to build that plant in Georgia. And so huge amounts of emissions. They laid a sidewalk of cement. They put enough cement in those two reactors to lay a sidewalk from Miami to Seattle. That's how much cement goes into those things. So all these emissions from the cement production, all the emissions from the background grid, and then an all, and le, and only 2.2 gigawatts of peak power. And it's a good capacity factor, like 85, 90% capacity factor, so it's continuous generation. But how many years will it take to recoup all those emissions for those 15 extra years that the background grid was running? I mean, I'll argue it will never recoup all those carbon emissions. And again, you, you're just, it made it so that Georgia is unable to put in a huge amount more wind or solar. And what we can see, when you put in a huge amount of wind or solar, you can get to huge grids. South Dakota is generating 96% of the energy it consumes from just wind and hydropower, with two-thirds of that being wind. Iowa is about is 80%. Montana is around 80% as well. And these states have put in the money, their money not into nuclear, but into renewables. California is this year 53 or 2023. 53% renewables in the annual average, and that's the fourth, the fifth largest economy in the world. The year before, it was 51%, so it's 50, it was almost 54%. So it's almost two and a half percent growth of renewables in one year. So we're not adding gas to the grid in California. California has a mandate, just like Colorado, to go to 100% renewables. We're not adding gas. In fact, this last weekend, Saturday, between Saturday and Sunday, one of the reactors at Diablo Canyon went down. So 1.1 gigawatts went down on the grid. On Saturday, the peak California was 102% renewable at its peak. Diablo Canyon went down 1.1 gigawatts. On Sunday, California was 109% renewables on the grid. So it went up. Now, not to say maybe the weather was a little better. Sure, but the point is, it's like, we don't need nuclear on the grid. I mean, yes, yeah, there, it's helpful. But in the case of, let's say, Diablo Canyon, I mean, one of the disadvantages of it, it's hogging the one transmission line to the coast, and it, it will result in less offshore wind going up off the coast of California because you need transmission to the coast. And so when it hogs the transmission line, uh, then you can't build as much offshore wind. We can keep the grid stable with renewables. There are multiple ways to do it, not only by adding more batteries and more generation, but in the case of California, offshore wind will give you uh, peak, it peaks in the summer at night, which gives you 24 hours a day of clean renewable electricity. We also have management of the grid, what's called demand response, where utilities give people incentives by having different electricity prices for different times of the day. And you also have exporting and importing of, of electricity. So there are ways that we keep the grid stable. I mean, all this growth of renewables on the grid, we haven't seen the grid go down. California hasn't had a blackout since 2020. And even though renewables have grown tremendously. Uh, my point is, again, I'll just reiterate the last thing that we have short time. If we want to focus on a solution that can be implemented quickly, there are a lot of things that could happen, should happen, might happen, but we can't rely on those to solve our problems. We need to focus on what works and what works effectively and cheaply with least uh, risk to humanity. So thank you. Great. Well, thank you both so much. Um, let's give both these panelists a round of applause. Yeah. No, I. I think you both brought up some really uh, fascinating points and, and food, you know, to food for thought, um, just the cost benefit and the opportunity cost of the time value of money and, and pollution that is, um, you know, at play when a, a waiting for a plant to come online is, is very interesting. Um, the cement thing was very interesting. I didn't realize the, the input uh, from an energy standpoint to build something like that. And, and your points on um, having the all of above strategy. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's all, Hopefully it was insightful for you all, and now it's time for you guys to vote again. <laughs> and again, the the uh, the thing we're looking for is the delta, the change, not not uh, where things started or ended necessarily. It's who had the, the greatest percentage of change in, in the direction. So we've got the pre-debate and post-debate, and we encourage you all to please, please vote. As you can see, it's changing as you vote, so it really does matter. So whether you're watching online or you're here, please, please take a minute to vote. We'll, we'll give you just a few more seconds. And I love that we're voting here at this geothermal energy. Uh, just 
innovator here at this college. It's very interesting. It looks like we started with about, Carrie, can you read that? Yeah, so we started at- 27 degree, 27%. That doesn't add up to 100. No, the, the, num the numbers don't add <laughs> Is up. Is that 87? Team, the numbers don't add up. They Can we fix that? Add up. Uh, just looking, there we go, 77. So this was before, this was after. This was before. Was this, was this the pre-debate poll? Yeah. This was the pre-debate poll, okay. This is the post-debate poll. Okay, go, let's go back to pre again. Okay, yeah, we have fewer undecideds. Um, so more have shifted over to Mark's direction from undecided. Does that say 27%? 67. 77. 77. <laughs> so Could, just, just, just one minute. Please display the pre-debate poll so we can clearly see it. <laughs> and then we're going to display the post-debate poll because okay. we want our audience and our speakers to be clear on, on what we're doing here. Okay, is, this is the pre-debate poll, is that correct? Okay, so we've got 77%, seven and 16 undecided, okay. Sixty-eight, twenty, and 12. So it shifted a little more toward disagree. Is that fair, yep. moderator? Yep, no, it, sh okay. it shifted in Mark's direction. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. For uh, Thank you to, again to our panelists for participating in this discussion. If you're interested in more uh, debate on energy and climate issues, Steamboat Institute has hosted numerous debates, five or six debates over the last two to two and a half years on energy and climate with, with very different um, nuances of the discussion. So you can go to our YouTube channel to see those. Once again, thank you to the Adolph Coors Foundation and all of our supporters. If you want to see more debates on college campuses, more debates back here in Grand Junction, please support the Steamboat Institute with your tax deductible support. We are a nonprofit organization. Uh, if you want to know about upcoming debates, be sure and follow us on social media. If you are here in Grand Junction with us tonight, stick around, have some pizza, visit with our speakers. If you're joining us online, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next debate.